Our next speaker is Chris Adams, and he will be talking about reducing carbon in the digital realm, uh, how to understand the environmental impact of the digital products you build, and take measurable steps to green your stack. The floor is yours. Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, can you folks hear me at the back? Yeah, if you can, just raise your hands. Excellent. Cool. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Adams. Uh, as you can see, uh, Mr. Chris Adams on pretty much every online, really. Uh, please don't try to follow this link because it's not going to actually go anywhere yet, but it will be up at the end of this talk. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself, if you don't already know me. Uh, my name is Chris Adams. I have a background working in environmental kind of wacky startups from Loco2, which was all about trying to make trains easier to book than planes. Amy, which was all about putting kind of carbon calculation as an API, so you could work out the carbon footprint of anything. And I'll spend a bunch of my time working with the Green Web Foundation, where our mission is to basically make the web green. And I also help organize an online community called climateaction.tech, which, as you can see, is for folk like yourselves who want to work out how to do something about climate in, in, the, in, in their day job and what they do. Uh, I've got about 45 minutes with you, and uh, this is a kind of rough outline for the day. I'm going to briefly give you a kind of primer on how you measure carbon and why you might measure that. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you a mental model which I found useful for helping think about what steps I can actually take as a professional working in this field. And then I'll give you some pointers of where to go next if you feel compelled to do something about well, what is essentially an existential challenge and uh, the biggest challenge we are really facing. So uh, first of all, uh, measuring carbon. So can you just show your, raise your hands if you've seen this before? Yeah, the water cycle. So you get the idea that we've got like a water kind of evaporates, goes along into the sky, then comes down and rains. And then generally, it's best if it, it doesn't all go in one place because that's a, that's a good thing. But generally, we have like cycles in nature. And one of them we have is, is for water. And uh, we also have uh, cycles elsewhere, and that's kind of what I want to share with you here, because there are also cycles around carbon. So what you're seeing here is actually some freeze frames of a really, really cool but somewhat confusing video. Uh, and uh, as I was saying, kind of carbon works on a kind of slower time scale that we might have here. So this is, an this is basically a diagram of all the carbon in the world with some idea of proportions. All right. So the green stuff up here, this is us. Like we're made of carbon, it turns out. So are trees. Trees are made of carbon. And when living things die and decompose, some of the carbon ends in the atmosphere as we decompose. Um, the purpley bit stuff here, this is like the ocean. Uh, fish are made of carbon too. And so are plants and everything like that. And when they die, they sink down, which is why you've got this massive, chunky like, uh, stock of carbon down here. Eventually, some of that might become sediment, then form rock, then end up in this kind of black stuff around here, which we kind of consider the, uh, the Earth's crust. So and then at the top, we've got carbon in the atmosphere. So you probably can't see it very well, but there is carbon up here. This is kind of atmospheric carbon, really. And there's like, if you watch this video that I've linked to, you can see it all moving around as a cycle. But this is kind of, well, carbon, really. So now, in about 1850, we started using a lot more energy. And, uh, and to meet that demand of, of all this energy, we started burning fossil fuels in earnest, as well as burning wood for fuel. And you can see the fossil fuels here as kind of stuff that's come out of here and is now re represented here. And uh, it's, we've also taken some carbon that was in the earth and burned some of that. And like, there's a, where, does, where, does all, where, where does this all go? There's a clue in these arrows on the screen, right? Now, if we fast forward to 2017, uh, it looks a bit more like this. You've seen like there's less of this red stuff down here because it's got into here, and because it's circulated all the way around, we've ended up with well carbon. Uh, we've ended up carbon in other parts of Earth, and in particular, you'll see that we have fewer red dots down here, but we've got a lot more around here, which has kind of pushed some of the carbon higher up here. So. This is kind of, I've, if there's one thing I want you to kind of really take away is that when we talk about climate, it's really about carbon and we need as an industry to be able to get good at understanding how to reduce carbon more than anything else if we're going to be thinking about climate. 
Now, I'll try and break this down to a kind of simple way, which I found really, really useful for this. There's a lady uh, on Twitter. Her name is Professor Julia K. Steinberger. She's awesome. But she has this really nice way. She recently like, shared this like, thread on Twitter where she basically explained how she explains kind of climate change to her children who are four and seven years old. And she basically did it this way. She got like a globe, wrapped it in some plastic, and then said, well, this is basically what happens. You understand the idea of being wrapped up and things are getting warm and things are getting too warm. That's it. And like, uh, that turned out to be a really effective way for her to do it. And uh, it turned out if, like, if kids can get this stuff, then I think we can. And I think it's really, really useful for us to kind of be aware that carbon is actually a thing that we do need to be able to count and track and account for in our jobs. So we've spoken about this at a kind of planetary scale, which isn't all that actionable. But if we were to kind of bring this down to an organizational scale, where most of us might kind of work at a more specific, uh, might be easier for us to act upon, it might look a little bit like this. There are established ways to measure carbon within an organization you work in. And in the same way that accountants might talk about legal ownership of a company, there are guidelines for talking about who has responsibility for emissions when you're reporting and deciding who should be, cha who should be making reductions. And uh, I'm sharing this diagram here to basically take some very, very dull, dry material into something that we can relate to, which is hot beverages and coffee. And uh, generally, you can think of, it, think of it like this. If I... Uh, I, there, there's three kind of scopes. There's uh, this idea of scope one emissions, which is basically if I burn fossil fuels to heat up a, say, container so I can have coffee, then uh, that's uh, the emissions from me burning those fossil fuels myself and my scope one emissions. Scope two might be me using a kettle. So if someone is, say, burning coal to generate electricity for me to kind of boil a kettle, then that's my scope two. Now, scope three might be me walking to a stall or into a coffee shop and all the emissions and all that supply chain, that's my scope three. So there's this idea of a kind of like dependency chain of carbon, which because I'm speaking to a bunch of people who have some understanding with technology, I think you should be kind of, you should, you should be relatively comfortable with the concept of dependency chains and things like that. And uh, to make this a bit, more, uh, a bit more concrete, I'll refer it to, say, a good example. So Stripe, has anyone heard of Stripe here? Okay, a few of you. Okay, so basically payments company, all right? Now, they are actually pretty good about sharing information about what they do and what their emissions are. And uh, you can see this here. They uh, they basically got, uh, in 2017, they started making noises about becoming carbon neutral. And they started reporting information in these kind of scopes here. And uh, you'll see this phrase, TC2OE, but basically just think of that as carbon dioxide, the stuff that's warming up the world. Because there's different gases, but they all have more or less the same effect. So in many cases, people will use the term CO2E to describe all of these kind of basket of gases. All right? But you'll see here that from uh, the scope one emissions are quite small because they're usually just heating a building. Scope two is a little bit higher because they pay to, say, uh, well, keep a building running. And then you'll see down here that uh, there's massive scope three because they tend to pay, pay for a lot of infrastructure and have a lot of people flying around as developer evangelists and so on. All right. Uh, let's look at some other, some other examples. Amazon. So Amazon repeat, um, started reporting on CO2 emissions for the first time this year. And uh, long story short, their carbon footprint is about the same as the country of Finland, right? Which is kind of large. And as you can see, because uh, obviously they run loads of servers, which is why you got four and a half million tons of CO2, they also have a lot of warehouses and things like that and have a lot of kind of cars or vehicles for getting things around. But because they actually have uh, a large supply chain themselves, they have a massive honking great scope, set of scope three emissions. So let's look at another company, right? Uh, Google. So Google's, uh, Google has uh, surprisingly low emissions considering its scale, uh, about the same as the African country of Liberia, all right? Now there's something interesting here. Google have uh, reported their emissions uh, with scope one, two, like, like you can see here, and three, but they have this interesting thing here where this is the energy they're using but this is the energy they say that they're using because they are purchasing what are basically called renewable energy credits, which is one way of using green energy if you do not have uh, access to green energy on certain parts of the grid. And Google are pretty good in this field, but it's worth bearing that in mind. Google are transparent about this stuff, whereas Amazon, you don't see these numbers. So this number could be sort of somewhat higher for we know, all right? So this gives you an idea of what some of these numbers might look like. And then let's look at another company, which was also uh, one you, I assume you might have heard of. 
if this works. Yes. Uh, oh, have I got it? Uh, Apple, yeah. So Apple have, uh, these are their emissions for just their facilities. So just their data centers and just, say, the offices that they have, right? So this is quite low by comparison, right? So this is carbon emissions of maybe the Gambia, another small African country, all right? And you'll see, once again, uh, by sourcing renewable energy, they've had a kind of quite big reduction in the emissions that they otherwise would have had. But you'll also see that in scope three, because uh, there's lots of flying and because there's lots of commuting, like you have a lovely new office uh, miles away from anywhere, so you have to drive to get there. You end up with like, I don't know, 40% of the emissions for just their facilities from people having to drive there and back, all right? But if you look at the emissions from Apple as all the products that people buy, you'll see that the emissions are somewhat larger, about the same size as Mongolia, which is kind of large. And you will also see that there is a large, this is a breakdown from Apple's own report, and they basically, they're pretty transparent about this stuff, and they're good on this, and they say this is where the emissions come from. And you, f you can see all the way around here, this is the manufacturing, the, uh, the machines they have. And then if we zoom in to like this bit over here, right, you'll see that there's a little bit of information, there's like okay, obviously use phase, but the main, car, the main impact from what they do is actually making the electronics. So this is kind of how we tend to think about a, a carbon and how might, one might report on carbon and make, re and make decisions to reduce carbon, all right? Now I'm gonna share with you a mental model which I found helpful in this field. I call it uh, platform packets and process. Uh, and it's generally aimed at taking something which is quite abstract, this scope one, two, and three thing, to something that you might act upon inside the teams that you work in. And it kind of maps to the, the kind of groups that you might be working in if you're, say, a front-end developer or a back-end developer or a designer or a product manager. So it kind of tries to map to that. And as you can see, platform might be infrastructure you run. Packets is infrastructure other folk run, like the rest of the internet, and process will be decisions that are made inside your organization that cause there to be emissions. So if you, hey, you're a large company and you have a massive, say, corporate campus, which is miles away from anyone else everyone has to drive to, then there's gonna be a load of emissions from that decision that you actually make. So let's run through this. Uh, on that scope one, two, three thing I shared with you, this is kind of how it maps, and this might look like some of the things, some of the activities you might have be involved in that will create emissions. So generally on the platform side, if, it's your, if you're running infrastructure yourself, it'll be scope two. If it's scope three, you'll see here, and well, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the other ones in more detail later. All right, so this is this two, the, the, the model that I'm sharing with you today. All right, so let's have a look at platform, infrastructure that you run. There are kind of three levers which I'm gonna share with you today which might be of use to you, all right? Uh, there are, so basically provisioning, provider, and I'm a bit wary about showing this last one because it's kind of new, the idea of programming languages. And that's partly based on some stuff from yesterday, but also I'm a bit wary about kind of inciting the pitchforks when I share this. Uh, but we'll see where we go with this. So provisioning is one lever you might actually have if you build digital products and you run servers, all right? So this, this chart you see here is a chart from uh, the CE Power of Wireless Cloud report. This basically shows how Australia uses the internet and uh, it gives you an idea that, well, we don't use the internet in a uniform fashion all the time because basically if you think about us being set at midnight, as we tend to fall asleep, we tend to use the internet less, all right? And then as we wake up, we might say kind of have coffee or something like that. And then as more of us come to work, we start using it more. And then later on, we work in during the day, then we all go home, but you will start watching Netflix and things. And then once again, we fall asleep and then we get to there. So there is a kind of pattern. And if you have any analytics on how your own tools are used or your own services are used, you'll see these kind of waves and patterns in how it works. And uh, this is worth bearing in mind because traditionally when we've be, had to provision service, services to support something like a website or a video streaming service, the way that we used to do it was basically buy a big server that could handle the peak usage. And uh, we just accept that because provisioning is quite a difficult kind of, because it's a real pain to do, we just leave this big box idling most of the time in the hope that we could actually hit the serve, serve things at the peak, right? Now, the downside of that is that, um, well, if we can make this conceptual leap that the cloud and computing is someone else's computer, then it shouldn't be that much of a leap again to realize that computers run electricity and uh, we generally burn fossil fuels right now to generate electricity. So in the example we had before, when we had this big box that wasn't being used, 
we would basically be burning money to pay for capacity we didn't have, but we're also burning fossil fuels and causing emissions one way. Now, we've got better at kind of running infrastructure, all right? So we've had this kind of trend over the last, say, 10 to 15 years to abstract machines away to make them easier to manage. So this might be VMs or containers or dynos or unikernels or whatever you might prefer to use. But in general, the pattern is make something more abstract and then make it easier to spin it up and down in response to uh, demand, all right? This is better because we now have something that looks a bit like this. So we are not, we're wasting less, uh, we're burning less money, but we're still burning money, and as a result, we're still burning fossil fuels. Now, there's uh, some new changes in the last few years, which are relatively recent, and uh, we're seeing kind of changes in how we work now, which look a lot, looks, look and sound are sometimes referred to as like serverless, or functions as a service, if you work on the back, on, on the back end with servers, right? Now here, this is uh, interesting because we're rewarded for efficient use of compute, because we basically pay on a per request basis. So if someone tries to load a page, we pay for specifically that request, and then when we're not using it, theoretically, we're paying for, no, we're, we're paying for nothing, and theoretically, things can spin right down. So there's a much clear, clearer mapping between the usage and uh, what you would pay for here. Now, there is a trade-off here uh, that is that the number of providers that if, we, if you want to use some tools like this and have this much tighter mapping is that we end up with a small number of people who do provide this. So if you were to go to, if you want to move to something like this, you generally end up using something like either Microsoft Stacks or Google's or AWS. And this kind of presents us with a kind of awkward problem right now. If we care about climate and we care about like, the, like basically being able to solve problems as, say, professionals, we end up having to choose two of these three things. So we kind of care about the fossil fuel thing because we're in a climate crisis officially now, right? Well, as of, uh, I think, December when the EU parliament uh, declared this. Um, if you are used to running any kind of online service, you'll be aware that in many cases there is a kind of shift to basically use a hosted thing because it turns out that running infrastructure is extremely complicated and in many cases if you can buy versus build then you'll often save yourself a lot of hassle. Then the final one thing is well avoiding oligopolies is quite a good thing and because uh, diverse ecosystems are healthy ecosystems and we kind of don't really have so many options right now. We, if you do care, care about this, it does feel a little bit like this. And uh, as we saw from just yesterday, if you were in this stage, you saw, um, you, you, you saw Julian Oliver talking about this and how much infrastructure he ended up having to run himself uh, in many cases because we end, we end up with this consolidation where if you want to use one service, you end up having to buy into all these other things associated with that company, all right? So that's one of the trade-offs you might have to think about when it comes to, say, uh, platform uh, and, and provisioning. Provider is also another decision uh, that, that might affect it. Now, I did mention in the beginning of this talk that you can basically reduce the emissions from what you do if you use, say, a cloud provider like AWS just by running it in a different uh, region. So you can see this map here. This is by this person who is basically paid by Amazon to build kind of sketch noty things. And this is a list of all the data centers. And you'll see the ones with the green leaves, which are marked as kind of sustainable regions. And you'll see on the right-hand side, uh, on the east coast of America, which is around North Virginia, which has traditionally been coal country, uh, that there's, you don't have much of the green regions there. But on the left-hand side, where you see a load of kind of leaves. And that's because on the west coast of America, there's a lot more hydro and, uh, and, and, and things like that. So you end up with a kind of a lower CO2 for each kind of unit of compute that, you'd be, that you're paying for. So yes, you can reduce the emissions just by switching from one region to another region. And this is because, basically, to, to expand that point I shared with you before, where you are in the world, like the place will affect the carbon intensity of the emissions that are come from running infrastructure anywhere. So let's have a look at Europe, right? So France, kind of green, full of nukes, right? So that's good for some people, maybe less so in Germany, right? Germany, which is up here, this is the land of solar and coal, right? So we're not all that green. England has actually got a little, quite a bit better than, than it was before. But up here, you can see Poland, Oh, not so good. Poland's really, really into coal. And as you can see up here in the Nordic states where there's loads and loads of mountains and wind and water, that things are really, really green. And uh, this gives you an idea that you can kind of see where the, emission, the likely emissions might be depending on where you are in the world. 
and uh, you might make decisions based on this. But to have to kind of compare against this is going to be quite a complicated process. So one thing that uh, we do, uh, or I, uh, at the Green Web Foundation, which is where I currently work, is we build like a directory to make it easier for you to make the, do, do, do the right thing. And uh, we pr present this information as an API and as data sets for you to kind of build into your own tooling, which I'll expand on a little bit later. But one of the key things is that your provider will actually have an impact on who you, uh, basically where something is, will have, will have an impact on the emissions from here. There's, there is also a kind of, this, at this point here, that I want to segue a bit into kind of energy markets, because when you start working with computers and you, if you have to, if you're responsible for running servers, the more you think about cloud or end up having to work with cloud, the more you realize how many, how many parallels there are to energy markets. Now, energy markets are really interesting in lots of strange ways, right? So in Europe, well, actually in lots of places around the world, you can have cases where the cost of electricity is actually negative rather than uh, positive. So like on a day where there's, which is really, really sunny or really, really windy, uh, for the, it's actually cheaper for the grid to basically pay people to uh, basically take energy off the grid to keep it stable than it is to say uh, power down a nuclear power station or power down some kind of large coal-fired power station. And in, and as a result, you end up, getting, end up with these scenarios where you have negative, you have negative costs. And one, of the, and one of the reasons here is to basically get people to kind of take this demand and put it to use in other places. And uh, I'm sharing this with you because it's a kind of, uh, the idea of like shifting load might be, might be something you're aware of as developers or trying to kind of delay jobs, for example. But you see this manifesting now in how we use energy, uh, well, basically with things like with EVs and things. So this is an example, uh, bulb energy in the UK. They will basically, if you have a car, uh, they will basically have tariffs now where depending on the time of day, or if you're prepared to kind of provide, be a little bit less uh, strict about when you need something running, then you'll get a cheaper, uh, che che cheaper electricity. And why am I sharing this with you? Because I think you're starting to see things like this uh, in, uh, on, like in, the in, in the realm of like uh, computing now. So this is a paper uh, that was shared this year at the ICT for Sustainability uh, basic conference in Lappen Rata, which I've misspelt. Sorry, Finnish people. And uh, the general idea is these, uh, these people started building a Kubernetes scheduler uh, to basically run Docker, great run machines, run, run workloads where energy was cheap and green by uh, basically tracking where, but, but for finding out where it was sunny, really. And uh, they were able to do this on uh, where they end up working with Microsoft to do this because Microsoft is one of one large company that has a number of data centers all around the world. But it kind of sucks that there's only one company that you can actually get this stuff from. Or that if you wanted to do something kind of cool with, say, a more decentralized use of the web, uh, that we, you have to kind of go through one large company. And uh, if we were to look at, say, what a maybe a more kind of open, green, and decentralized web or internet might look like, there's actually some lessons that we could learn from the energy sector over the last, say, 10 to 20 years. So Germany, one thing that we saw was the energy vendor over the last 15 years. And uh, the result of that was that we had like cheap, green, distributed energy. So that we, Germany is interesting in the sense that it has quite a heterogeneous grid. Uh, so there's lots and lots of smaller providers of energy rather than number uh, of lots of small providers rather than just a handful of huge providers. And uh, there's lots of reasons why having a diverse ecosystem is helpful in this rate. And I kind of wonder, like, this is one I share with you as an idea. What if we have something like a digital vendor, right? What if we could do something like this to kind of abstract computing away to the point that you can run these in the same way? There are companies that are now doing stuff like this right now. And uh, there's one company called Helio Exchange that does exactly this. But the paper I showed you before shows you there's stuff around there. So this may provide a way away from having to rely on just basically an oligopoly and concentrating more power if we were to kind of be prepared to think a bit more about how we run computing around. So the final thing is, uh, this is what I was a little bit worried about sharing, was program programming language. So where appropriate, you can actually have an impact here as well because different languages have different goals and uh, that can result in reduced emissions uh, from just, just much more efficient use of resources. So this is uh, Hannes uh, Menet yesterday. He was presenting some work he's been doing on Mirage RS unikernels, all right? And uh, although you probably can't see it, he was basically making a, making a point that 
This is how he was running this stuff before. Then when he switched to using unikernels, he saw uh, memory usage and CPU drop massively by just having a be kind of better use of the existing resources. So this was like a 25-fold decrease uh, in compute use and a 10 times uh, decrease in like RAM usage. And uh, you see the same things with other computing, uh, uh, other languages. And uh, well, the nice thing is this is recorded now, so you can see it too tomorrow. All right. But there's also papers that talk all about this stuff. So um, if depending on what your goals might be, there may be certain languages which are really better kind of uh, uh, optimized for the task that you might actually have. Now, does this mean that I'm saying that we, we should all go out and code everything in OCaml, C, and Rust? No, that's a really, really, I, I, we choose languages for a wide range of reasons, from ecosystem to hiring to like developer happiness. And uh, when you look at a project or a product level, you'll see that these kind of micro optimizations, as, while they're fun, might not be the most effective way to achieve some emission, emissions reductions, but it's still out there and it's worth being aware of. And also, it's worth thinking about if you are able to kind of think about the entire stack of tools you might be using, then you're kind of doing something like this in many cases if you, say, use like Redis or Nginx or something to serve things. So that's the idea for like platform. Now let's talk about packets. So this is, uh, I've spoken about infrastructure you, you control. This is infrastructure you do not control, all right? Now, you cannot really control the other parts of the internet, and that's generally considered a good thing. But what you can do is control how much data you send over the wire instead, all right? And uh, if we were to kind of look at, say, the amount of energy we send over the wire, data we send over the wire, and we figured out that, well, sending data uses infrastructure, which uses energy, which uses fossil fuels, then we've got some bad news. Like, we've seen pages growing in size to the point that the average, the I think the mean web page size is now larger than the original download of Doom, all right? But we're also seeing it because we have mobile phones, so we use this more, all right? And then because cellular networks tend to use more energy to shift the same amount of data as, say, wired or Wi-Fi networks, we are making a loss here. So from a kind of energy and, cl and climate point of view, this is like the worst scenario we can imagine right now. Thankfully, there are this, if we think about web page budgets as basically carbon budgets, we realize that we have lots of tools that we can repurpose for carbon reductions. So one example is Google's Lighthouse. It basically runs checks against your page, then it grades you on how well your page is optimized. So what we've been doing at the Green Web Foundation is taken Lighthouse, we forked it, and we made Greenhouse which was basically the same idea, but it kind of looks at how many resources you run uh, and then says, well, yeah, climate emergency, folks. Maybe you don't want to write, uh, get all your stuff on fossil fuels. And uh, there's some other things from here. We we're also working to make it kind of work out the carbon footprint from this because these numbers exist, but uh, that's further down the line. But you can also see that I'm referring to the ethical web uh, principles here. If you care about this as a professional, this is something the, uh, the, the creators of the web are now saying and giving you license to be doing. For you to say, look, I don't want to do this. There is a moral argument for doing this. And if I want to build the web as, uh, as, uh, as, as Tim intended, then you can refer back to these ethical principles now for this. But I will need to share with you that that doesn't mean that we should just like read a, optimize every single web page and that'll be fine, right? It's worth getting a sense of perspective around this, all right? Um, video, like of the video just dwarfed web traffic uh, when we think about designs we might make. Like to give you some context, um, this chart is just showing you an idea of where, of like usage of like data flows, right? Now 60% of the, this is, this basically is just telling us that all the video used and streamed is about 300 kind of megatons of CO2. Uh, that was, that's what it was in 2018, which is roughly the carbon footprint of Spain. All right, so all the video, Spain. That's a kind of number, some numbers you might want to look at. Now, video on demand, like say Netflix and stuff, that's like the country of Chile. Porn, that's like Austria. All right, so these are some kind of like reference points for you to kind of refer to now. All right, and. Uh, I speak a bit about process now, and like uh, this is why it's worth thinking about some other things. This is why I also care about kind of making the web a green, because I think it's going to be easier to make the entire internet green than it is to stop people watching porn, basically, which is a, a statement, I suppose. So uh, I spoke a bit about process uh, and how there are other things you can do uh, outside of computers. All right. So uh, 
they are, oh, there's, there's two ways I'm going to share this. So there's kind of inward looking at process, like the greening of how we build digital products, right? This isn't visible to the end users, but it's still a useful thing to do. Now, uh, the, an example of this is the company called uh, Whole Grain Digital. I really admire them. They're a really, really cool company doing some good stuff on the web. And uh, they are one of the original kind of WordPress agencies. And they basically say, yeah, we do everything with WordPress and green energy. And they started working at their own missions on blogging about this. And what they said was that they, they, know the, uh, they, they looked at these figures and they switched to running on green infra uh, because that was the kind of right thing for them to do. But when they started doing that, they started looking at where else are their emissions in what they do. And they basically looked at it and so realized that, oh, wow, a large part of their emissions just comes from travel. And you, as you can see, office and home energy. And of the travel, around 94% of their emissions came from commuting. So this is why I'm saying that it's more than just playing around with computers and, um, and optimizing stuff, all right? Uh, so this was kind of useful, and this kind of inspired some of the work at the Green Web Foundation for us to start sharing this. And uh, what uh, we've been doing recently is basically take this model and build some, like, I guess, MVCC, which is I'm referring to as minimum, minimum viable carbon calculator, not the Postgres. Uh, uh, other kind of acronym there. And uh, we basically built like a simple spreadsheet that was very, very fast to fill out. So pe pe to people to kind of get an idea of, okay, these are the things I'm uh, paying to run. Uh, this is the like, uh, if I build a web project, this is how much data I'm shifting over time. And then because it turns out that it uses energy to keep people warm and dry inside buildings, and that uh, people tend to use energy commuting, then we track, it, we track that as well. And uh, we do this to give people some figures and get some idea of where they might want to act upon this. Because the current ways that you report on, say, emissions or think about this is like an annual report every year. That's a really, really slow debugging cycle. That means we have like eight, what, nine kind of hits of the F5 key before like it's a climate apocalypse. That feels like we should probably do better than that. But this is um, entirely open. You can link to the template yourself. And uh, we, we learned some interesting things when we did this. We realized that when we were working on this, because uh, the team were pretty good on commuting because a lot of them cycled to work, their emissions are quite low there. But we also realized that uh, there was actually an argument for changing how we design, say, a web, uh, an existing website. We found that one chunky background video, you know those things that we all hate, right? That had the same carbon footprint as basically the entire team commuting for the entire project, all right? So it's quite easy to make an argument to get rid of that and make a, meaning, make a kind of meaningful, measurable reduction there. So these are um, some of the stuff that we do now in this. The other thing is um, outward process. So uh, these might be decisions you make that affect uh, the kind of emissions through use or, 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 or for your end users. And these are going to be much more visible to end users. Uh, the example I like to refer to, because I'm a fan of the company, is Fairphone. You folks have heard of Fairphone here, right? Yeah, like they're basically the canonical fair trade smart, smartphone, really. All right, that's the best way to describe them. And they also, they, they, there's lots of good things about what they do, but they also share lots of information about their own carbon emissions and what steps they're trying to take to reduce them in a relatively honest way, which is also really good. And because they publish it, you, we can read it. Now, we've seen trends in electronics over the last, say, five or six years where, where we had modular things and we saw a few failed attempts at having like, modular smartphones. We've been a shift towards like systems on a chip and stuff like that. So if you are going to do that, that means in some way that, modular, that having a modular design is a challenge. But it means that if most of the energy uh, or impact on building electronics is coming from basically turning sand into a chip with lots and lots of energy, then we'll need to think about where we might have uh, a way to decouple this from the rest of it, all right, to uh, make us the electronics we do have last longer, all right? And uh, this is what uh, Fairphone did in their own LCA, Life Cycle Analysis Report, where they look at the emissions over the entire process. They basically, well, first thing is, firstly, the, uh, the actual use is pretty small for this. But, uh, well, you can see here, uh, the emissions were from the production. And the thing they, 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 they decided to do was make the phone as easy as possible to repair for end users uh, or, or replace parts of it to make it go from, say, a five-year product, product to a, uh, from a three-year product to a five-year product. And this had the impact of reducing the emissions by a measurable figure. And it's a pattern that we might follow ourselves, all right? 
Now, actually, Fairphone make a make a real feature of this now, and they talk about this uh, to their kind of to their to their audience. So they basically say, if you uh, can just say, upgrade just the camera rather than the rest of the phone that is still kind of working, then you can reduce the carbon footprint over the lifetime with these kind of figures. And I think this is actually worth sharing because it it hints that there are options for us to actually be doing something until we can run everything on green power, which would affect these numbers. And uh, I think I've shared with you like a mental model and see how it can be uh, activated. I've spoken a bit about kind of carbon. I'm now just going to give you some steps of where to go next. So, okay, it's 2020, right? And I kind of feel this feels like the table st stakes. And I'm really glad that at least one person is taking photos of this. I'd really like it if more of you to take some photos of this and share with your peers. Because I think the single most effective thing we can do as communities is stuff like this, all right? We would expect... We need to kind of make this just, we need to change the aesthetic about how we build things. So in the same way that we would expect a builder to know about asbestos, and we expect automotive engineers to know about lead po poisoning particulates, I think as professionals, we need to know about the impact of carbon in what we do, and that we don't need it to build digital services. And I think if we can build electric cars in the automotive center, then we can build green stacks in technology. And I think we need this to become the norm. So this is what I need. I need your help here to share this with your boss, with your coworkers, set something like this. We've had people talk about just how bad the situation is. And like this is really like one of the minimum things we can do, which doesn't actually have a massive cost for us to actually do. So if we do, we need something like a, cl like a cloud moonshot to get off fossil fuels. And this is one thing I really would ask you to really consider. So asking for this is a bit easier if you have friends. So um, I'm in a group called climateaction.tech where it's basically just a Slack group with a few other things that we now run from here and run meetups. And uh, the idea is that we do this to kind of share what the strategies are to actually kind of uh, push for this kind of stuff because not everyone can join Extinction Rebellion and I'm not sure that everyone should join Extinction Rebellion. They used to, they're, 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 we have different... We have different aspects of ourselves that we bring in, a, in, in, in our work compared to where, where else we want, what might work. Now, um, if you are interested in acting upon any of this, uh, I work at the Greenman Foundation and we provide, we have like an open source platform where you can check your stack and any tools you have to, to do this. And uh, if you are interested about any of this stuff, we are trying to find a way to make it easier or to make some of this much more transparent because I shared with you before about how large companies can basically fudge some of the numbers to make them, to make them look greener than they otherwise might be. So uh, tomorrow we're running a kind of, on lecture room two, we're running something like of a workshop to figure out what some of this might look like in the same way that we set up robots.txt. So carbon.txt, a way to verify this. There's a website uh, that, that's been hastily put together to give you some idea for this. And uh, finally, I'm just going to wrap up now. Uh, thank you for letting me talk to you about this stuff here. Um, if you're interested in getting in touch and talking to me, please do, uh, at the Green Web Foundation. Uh, I'm Mr. Chris Adams on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, we are starting to do some training around this because we've realized that although most of us do care, we don't have much in the way of act ways to act upon this kind of stuff. Then finally, if you find this interesting, there's a newsletter which uh, I've started with a friend of mine, Martin, where we're basically sharing what we learn as we go through it, which bits are hard, which bits aren't so hard. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, we do have plenty of time for a Q&A. Uh, nonetheless, I would like the Q&A to be high quality. So if many ask a question, it should be a question. Thanking the speaker is lovely and nice, but don't waste our co collective benefit on that and do that afterwards on your own. Uh, and I don't really care what your name is and what your affiliation is. Just ask a question and make it short and so on. And the first two questions go to the internet. You mentioned um, the preview for the workshop, a Carbon TXT, just now. Yes. Can you already share some strategies, how, for example, the Green Web Foundation and other such directories um, can protect themselves against um, being abused by companies, for example, through greenwashing? So I think... Um, okay, I th you just need to re read some reports about this kind of stuff and uh, get familiar with this. Now, I really apologize that a large punch of this was incredibly dry. There is lots and lots of dry material around this to actually figure this stuff out. Um, I think it's mainly a case of working out what numbers you, or what questions you might actually have to ask. And I can share a link specifically for the questions that you need to ask. But generally, I think the four things I would look for is if an organization 
hasn't made a public uh, statement about when they're going to hit zero emissions, if they're not sharing their progress on an annual basis, um, if they're not sharing how much of their business they get from basically the, uh, from, from, from fossil fuels right now, uh, then, or, or how much of the business is still involved in extracting fossil fuels from the ground. I think these are the key things. And if they're not using this kind of scoped emissions process, which is a clear thing, or finding numbers, those are the biggest ones. There is a, pa there is a page on that I've got which lists these questions to ask. And uh, I'll, share, I'll, I'll share a link to it once I get on the interwebs to link to this. And a second question from IRC. Um, the numbers that you mentioned that the companies themselves uh, publish, can you verify them? And if yes, how? So the thing that you can, oh, that was the other thing, is independent verification is the thing you need to ask for as the final one. Sorry, I've just finally seen where the voice is coming from. It's like the voice of God speaking. Uh, the, yeah, independent verification is very important. Uh, all the examples I've pointed to had uh, independent verification, usually from uh, a set of companies that do auditing of this kind of stuff. Now, there is a, again, there's a firewall of tedium around this stuff, like that thing where I showed you with the Google, with Google's numbers being high than low. This is because you need to kind of go into the minutiae of understanding market-based reporting versus location-based reporting. And there's reporting around this stuff. There's like loads of academic literature, but it's just not very accessible to lots of people right now. There need to be more of us who do do this stuff. Uh, this is partly one of the reasons we want to have something like carbon.txt was to basically, A, give people a chance to see this, but also link to the specific documentation they're referring to. So you can ask, okay, so it's nice that you've done this, but where's, this, where's the third party verification of this? Or why is the same guy called Trevor being uh, 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 basically audited all of these companies and like literally it's the same dude who's reported Amazon's and Apple's and I'm not sure about Google, right? But uh, Trevor's probably a good guy. But the fact that there is only one person doing this is kind of, come on, we know, we, we know that there are things that you probably don't want to do in this field. Also in Europe at least, uh, f if you want to sell renewable energy, you do need to register this with uh, the government registry. And uh, there, is, there is something in the, in the, I didn't really talk about in this, in this session, uh, that I'm going to talk about more in carbon.txt is how to find this and how to look this up. Basically, everything we know about SSL and DNS, you can basically apply it to solve this kind of problem without needing a, a freaking blockchain, all right? And you can actually find something useful here, right? Like, this data is out there. It's just that we need to be able to know the right questions to ask and uh, make sure that, well, we are running stuff on a green stack rather than a brown stack. Okay. Uh, microphone number six. Is that your question? Hello, and thanks for your, uh, thanks for your great I said talk. something about thanking the speaker before. Yes, uh, I know. That's why I said it. Um, I understand you could try uh, to convince people to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, now, the managers I have been working under are generally good in reducing cost. Do you think it would help to translate carbon emissions into cost and have this problem solved by the invisible hand? So this is actually the approach that Amazon use and for some of the spreadsheets I was showing you before, where we do not have numbers for, car, for, emission, for reported emissions, the best thing you can go on is going to be sector level averages for the carbon intensity of spending a thousand pounds or a thousand euros in a particular area. So you might look at it like that. I, I kind of feel that there are certain people who really respond to this kind of like cost-based me messaging. But I think it's more attractive for us to kind of change the aesthetic around what we do. So rather than us continually striving, I mean, if we had the narrative for people for our generation was to basically save the planet, that feels a much more attractive thing than, than using cost. But I do, I'm, a, I'm aware that if you are in an organization where the primary driver is cost, then you need to be able to use that language. And that's why we've been speaking about some of that. But there are lots and lots, there's actually stuff in this field to show this. There's, um, there are organizations that will basically help you quantify the risks uh, from doing nothing versus the cost of action. Because in many cases, when we talk about this, we think that we, we often use, the, you hear the phrase, well, what's it gonna cost to shift to kind of a green energy, for example? But it's like we, we, like, like we pretend there is no cost to inaction when there really, really is. And we've seen just the five years, massive, massive changes in the destruction of companies and industries and, well, and, 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 and hundreds and hundreds of lives as well. So I think that you can use cost for this, but I, don't, I think it's a bit reductive to only use cost. Question for microphone number two. 
In your, <clears throat> in your research, did you encounter a trade-off between uh, privacy and security and carbon ne neutrality? And if yes, in which cases? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, I used to work at a company, Amy. Uh, one of the key ideas behind the company was that if you can uh, understand the company's CO2 emissions, you can understand their supply chain. And if you understand the supply chain, then uh, in some ways you can use that as a kind of cost to kind of beat beat an organization to reduce their prices because you can see that they're much more wasteful compared to other ones. But at the same time, this is a, so that works at an organizational level. There's also a personal aspect to this. And I think that this is, uh, I actually feel that in many cases, focusing on, on individual action and uh, kind of shaming people for a bit is, has been proven not to be very, very effective. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do any. Uh, there isn't, uh, there isn't a, c a cause for individual action because I think that provides the cover for, cl for politicians to make the decisions which will result in kind of real meaningful changes. So there is a trade-off because in order for you to understand the emissions, uh, because basically emissions are essentially a proxy for activity and you will usually see this and uh, there are plenty of stories around this and hopefully there might even be a topic um, about this specific subject at Republica in May. Because, yeah, there is uh, lots of interesting literature around this trade-off that we do actually have to make. Microphone, microphone num uh, number one. Hi. Uh, can you make an educated guess on how much emission could be spared if, like, the big providers would follow your advice? Mm. So, I guess it's tied to the... You know I showed you the numbers with Google, like the, the different kind of charts, right? You could make this kind of like coy arg this I don't know, just cheat argument and just say, well, that'd be all of it, right? But I don't think that's uh, really accurate. Generally, if we are looking at just the CO2 emissions from just like running the internet, right? I reckon you could probably wipe out uh, two thirds to eighty percent of 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 uh, by. But it actually depends on it. It, it, it kind of depends on where you might be looking at this actually. So more than half comfortably. All right, because if you look at, say, data centers, the main, dr dr the, 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 main the, the, the main, the main source of uh, emissions is from them being on 24-7, continually used, like three quarters of the emissions, assuming that data centers are full of servers which are used for three to five years, which is common. I'm not sure this is the case. Please talk to me if it's not the case, because I hear rumors that that might not be the case at large companies, but no one will write this down. So until you know that, I can't give you a really educated a really kind of better guess than that, but it would be lovely to find out if that data exists and there are a load of hackers here who might be able to know about this kind of stuff. Microphone number four. Uh, when you talk about uh, moving computation around the globe, basically according yeah. to the weather, I wonder if there isn't a lot of overhead associated with that, like additional communication, maybe if you now you're far away from your database, you need mm. more routing hops or whatever. Do you know anything about that? Yes, uh, the I spoke to the guy, um, um, I led James, who was actually working on that, and I said, hey, what you said. And he said, yeah, we take that into account because we can work out the emissions from moving um, a container of this, of this size to over there. And in many cases, um, we might move the state that we actually want to query there as well. So his approach was to basically apply various kinds of metadata tags to the kind of jobs you might want to run uh, to provide this kind of flexibility. And this is not a new idea. Like uh, Mastodon C uh, is a kind of data science company that started doing something like this 10 years ago. They're kind of the OG green cloud uh, people doing this kind of stuff. And even before then, there's this phrase called chasing the moon, where, where there was this idea that, yeah, you can do this if you run stuff on the dark side of Earth, which sounds super metal, right? But is, uh, shows that this is not a new concept, really. But it is cool. Microphone number five, please. Uh, hi. Do you see any chance of getting like governmental support with this? For example, like with tax cuts for electronic cars. I mean, maybe that would be possible in here too. Yes, I was actually at the EU Commission uh, green public procurement workshops they've been doing for the last like few months, and uh, I was. There were a tiny number of people from small companies. There were lots of large, large companies who were there saying, yes, the thing you should do is move to the, our cloud. That's the clear solution to the climate crisis. Uh, but they actually, it does look like there's guidance and uh, there is going to be uh, support in this field, all right? So I do know there's going to be um, 
well, we've already seen this. Like we've seen the e European Parliament declare a climate emergency, saying we need to halve emissions by 2030. That's eight. That's around eight percent year on year for, uh, for the next 10 years. Now, most of us don't know what that looks like because the last time you saw. 8% drop in a single year was the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is partly why I'm kind of sharing stuff like this, because I think the idea of having a more managed reduction of emissions feels more kind of conducive to, I guess, kind of continuity of, of, of how we live than the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I think there, there is stuff out there, uh, but in many cases, we don't have the knowledge right now as people in the sector to know what is effective. And this is something that we need to, as professionals, learn to uh, learn where the levers are if we want to consider ourselves as professionals facing the scale of the challenge that is ahead of us. Microphone number two, please. Hello. Uh, so uh, my question is about, uh, you talked a lot about how much a carbon emission uh, happens because of running a server yep. and in the server side. But if the traffic goes really, really high in a really large scale, you might have loss of emission just because of the transmitting the packet through the data center from an, uh, through IXPs and backbones, plus mm. uh, like the um, carbon emission from rendering the page in the like mm. phones and everything around that. Uh, is there, I was looking for it for a while, but I couldn't find the number like saying, okay, one terabyte of traffic in the data center from United States going to cost like this much of carbon. Ah, yeah. Is that what your question? Like, yes. What's the carbon footprint of a gigabyte of data or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to have some number saying like which one is uh, like translate uh, traffic to a number. Okay, so there are two organizations who are doing something, some work in this field. Uh, in fact, there's a whole kind of, kind of, community around greener web performance where they are tracking this kind of stuff. Now, uh, the, there's a group called the Shift Project, who I referenced before, who talk about the, carbon for, the video being the carbon footprint of Spain. They've actually got some browser extensions which you can install into Firefox. It will give you numbers as you browse, as you browse to see this. Um, I've also put together just like some interactive notebooks so you can get some ballpark figures of this kind of stuff yourself. So very quickly you can decide, well, do I do this or do I just do something different? So. Uh, Yes, look at the Green Web Foundation. There's a link specifically to a, w a notebook with the, so with the sites, uh, with, with the numbers for this. Next question goes to the internet. Hi. IRC states that in their experience, Kubernetes uh, has a quite a high CPU idle uh, usage, about 40% is mentioned. Um, this mechanism that you showed to adapt the um, server usage to the demand, uh, does this mitigate against this? I don't really know enough about Kubernetes to give a useful opinion on Kubernetes. Uh, so my thing was like, this is an interesting idea because it's, uh, it's treating cloud and co compute like a utility. And as a result, we see patterns that we've seen s have success in other sectors, but that could be applied to us. I don't know beyond that, but I can tell you that there's a lot of, uh, well, there's basically funding going into this kind of stuff now. But I'm sorry, I don't know much more than that. But uh, if you do work with Kubernetes, please do talk to me, because it would be really nice to have a better answer than I don't know in future. Um, microphone number three. How many talks do I have to attend here so that it will have been worth it traveling here from Munich instead of watching this online? Uh, so it depends what, okay, first of all, I think coming to a conference, just because there's talks, that's not the reason to come to a conference. You come to a conference to have high quality, high contact conversations with other people and get something useful from that. Because like you said, you don't need to do that. That said, the idea of like having kind of physical community is actually very, very useful. Uh, I think that there isn't a number, I can't say like seven, because that's gonna be meaningless. But the, uh, the, there is a whole issue around basically the carbon footprint of traveling to events. And in many cases, uh, so for, for, for some context, we, uh, I was organizing a conference uh, in London called, or helping organize a conference called MapCamp, and we were trying to internalize the carbon costs of people traveling. And we found that some, basically a minority of people coming across the Atlantic Ocean wiped out, I think about half the carbon footprint, uh, the kind of carbon budget for a 600 person conference. So there is some numbers around that. We've actually hired a group to give, to actually publish some of this inf information out there. And uh, there's some, there's, there's, there's a couple of widgets to, for you to figure this stuff out, but if you're here for the talks, that's one thing, but really you're, you should be here to make, speak to the other people and get some kind of a meaningful, meaningful connection you can have from there. 
Okay, microphone number one. Um, <clears throat> is this possible to create like an automated way, a platform or service that uh, tech companies can connect to and uh, estimate, like have a rough estimate about the carbon footprint based on the stack they use, based on the bandwidth, based on the, you know, uh, different process information? It depends. This, re this relies on the organization uh, having access to the metrics that will go in as an input. So garbage in, garbage out, right? So the spreadsheet I pointed to gives you a very, very low quality version of doing that. There's also a tool called AWS Cost Ex sorry, Green Cost Explorer. We basically forked uh, AWS Cost Explorer, worked out which, ones, which regions are running on fossil fuels, and then we present that information back to you so you can get some idea for this. So you can work out these numbers, but I don't see them right now, largely because a lot of organizations see this information as commercially sensitive, so they don't like to share this. So we have to go on basically kind of some rough numbers here. And this is one of the problems that we do have, and that came up with the Grim Public Procurement thing, was that we don't have the transparency right now to make the particularly informed decisions about this. But theoretically, yes. Microphone number five. <coughs> Hi. Um, I have a, uh, like a question about this double, uh, the double things that you're doing. On one side, you have the getting things done, like building sustainable infrastructure, and in the last days, yesterday, there was a couple of examples of that. And on the other side is generate momentum, like convincing people to join uh, the movement and be more aware of that. So I, I want, I'm wondering how does, for example, the Green Web Foundation um, apply to that in the sense then how radical can you be? Like, can you kick out people from your uh, directory because you uh, think you're, they are not doing green enough? Or how does this uh, work? So I should be clear about the Green Web Foundation just being a handful of guys. It's not a big thing at all, right? So it's been running for about 10 years. And uh, this is a thing that we've been doing over the last six months. I mean, I joined in March. and We started looking through this. And uh, we are basically now, we've been contacting our providers and say, look, we need you to provide some more useful and um, some more rigorous in, in, uh, data evidence to back up your green claims for this reason because it's very very because you can't well basically it's uh, as the stakes have got higher it's become more and more important to actually do this and if you're going to base decisions about how you kind of choose infrastructure from now on it makes a lot of sense to do that so we are heading in that direction to basically say look if you can't share this information we're going to stop listing you uh, and uh, but we have given because we are not, we, we're not so sure ourselves, and this is, this is, this is uh, we, we've given people a deadline uh, to get this information. So you'll probably see some of the stats change over the coming weeks as the way that we do our reporting changes. But because we release open data sets around this on a regular basis, you can actually see this. Okay, microphone number two. Hi. Uh, have you heard about the science-based targets initiative? And if yes, what do you think of them? So science-based targets is interesting because they are one of the drivers to basic... So if, you, if you're not familiar what science-based targets are, science-based targets are basically a way to say, well, if you're an organization and you want to hit net zero, the science uh, dictates that you need to take these steps here. I actually think they're better than uh, nothing in a lot of cases. And I think they're probably one of the more effective things to use. And they also insist that you do need to understand the emissions in your supply chain. So I imagine organizations that sign up to science-based targets will come bump up against the problems that I've uh, just explained about trying to get numbers from the larger uh, uh, companies who tend to be coy about sharing this stuff. I think it makes total sense at a corporate level uh, if you're if you're are not a state body, but I feel that the legally binding targets that are now in place in the UK and we're likely to see in Europe in the next six months to a year would be greater uh, levers because they provide a degree of certainty for people to then justify decisions because it's the law now rather than being a thing that you might get kind of plaudits for. Okay, question from the internet. You mentioned that um, video on the internet uh, is a large majority of the energy usage. Can you say something about how this breaks down to encoding, storage, transmission, and decoding? Yes, um, those numbers, I understand, are all about just the transfer. So they, I don't think there is much about the encoding parts on that. That's just sending it. 
And quick follow-up, can you approximately say how much people can save uh, by, for example, staying on single definition or SD uh, instead of HD? <sighs> I was it was it four times I don't know what the what the, the, the change in resolution would be and it's not something uh, I feel comfortable sharing numbers on because I'd basically be get, making it up on the spot um, I actually feel that the solution is telling people to not do something like this I think it's a really really hard ask and seriously speeding uh, getting off fossil fuels is a much better way to solve this problem than telling people they're not allowed to watch Netflix ever again or only in low resolution for example like we like technology because we're like 15,000 people here because we like technology telling everyone you don't get to use technology anymore is going to be is much much harder to sell than just use green power and stop running fossil fuels okay last question goes to microphone number one Hello, I work for a company that... Uh, I said something about affiliations and introductions. <laughs> State your question. We're pretty much out of time. Um, if a company owns a lot of servers and um, the only solution um, to reduce the carbon footprint was uh, to uh, switch to green energy, um, this would increase the costs for the energy. And um, I'm afraid that um, I don't have good arguments to... Um, uh, Yeah, to ask them to switch to green energy because of the costs. Green energy is cheaper than fossil fuel energy now. Like it's, uh, it's it, we've we've seen this massive reduction in costs. Like, uh, like storage has come down by 85% percent in the last say 10 years. We've seen a massive drop in renewables. Like this argument is kind of being solved at that level. There, it's uh, if, if choice of provider is something separate, is separate. But uh, I think in many cases, it's going to be a case of choosing who you want to do that. And if you're trying to make this argument here, you can make the argument that generally com people tend to want to work in companies that are not destroying the planet. And if you want to retain people or attract new people, saying, hi, we're part of the solution, not the problem, is a good way to present this. And that's why lots of organizations talk about kind of green credentials because it's a recruiting tool in the same way that you talk about open source or working from home or everything like that, especially as we get older and have more kids and then realize that, wow, they'll be alive when this stuff happens. Okay, thank you so much. We're out of time.